Hi guys, Anthony Medical SBG. We're here on the Speakeasy, and we got some heavy hitters in here. This is uh, Green, Green and Klein, right? Yes. Right. Out of Houston. Attorneys. And today we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, like statutes of limitations. Statutes of limitations. Now you guys are out of, you guys are Colorado. Texas, Florida, and New York. New York. And New York, and then we'll do one-off cases in other, like we've got a case in Kansas we've done, and we'll appear for specific cases in other jurisdictions too. It just depends on that. You can do that usually one at a time. You can pro hoc in and be on a particular case in a particular okay. jurisdiction. By the way, those are the four, four top leading catastrophic loss storm states. Just Pretty so much for the last 10 years, this so happens, so you guys got quite a bit of business Yeah, I wonder states. how that worked out. <laughs> So let's talk about, guys, before we get into because there's a lot to talk about, cosmetic exclusions, we're going to talk about appraisals, we're going to talk about Colorado and Texas, all kinds of goofy stuff. Let's talk a little bit how you guys, each of you guys got into this crazy business. I guess starting with you. Yeah, uh, I was born in Orange, Texas. Uh, my dad was... That was Bob. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a mechanic, my mother was a school teacher, uh, but everybody liked to argue in my family, uh, so I went to law school and got paid to argue. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Been doing it for about 41 years now. Now you actually worked on the carrier side for a number of years, didn't you? Or? Uh yeah. I started with a big firm in Houston and and uh, became coverage counsel for uh, firms like Hartford and Travelers, where they would come uh, to me and I'd write an opinion letter as to whether or not I thought there was coverage in that particular case or not. And that's kind of how you got into the insurance side of the insurance restoration correct, side? Correct, correct. Because that's a unique, I mean, when we look at, uh, you know, we do this, the Wind of Storm Conference every year, you guys come to that. When I look at the policyholder attorney segment, you know, there's a lot of divorce attorneys out there, there's a lot of personal, but you don't often hear about this segment called, what do you call it, first party? Uh, first party. First party insurance or? Mm -hmm. First party insurance. It's, it's not a huge segment like there are, like divorce attorneys. Right? No, usually when you, get a, when you get a storm like Ike or somebody, something like that, a lot of lawyers will start doing it. But then they don't they don't do it. They don't specialize, right? In it. Yeah, right. and that's basically all we do. Mm -hmm. I think we've got two or three cases that aren't that. The rest are all this. Yeah. Now, when you when you go to uh, law school, is there a special training after your law degree to learn how to deal with big insurance companies and their, and their issues, <laughs> hard shenanigans, hard knocks? You, know? yeah. you just get out of general. So you, get, so you got to learn it. You learn as you go. Yeah. You learn as you go. I mean, I learned a lot. I grew up in a claims environment. My dad was a Class A registered general contractor for 30 years before he went to work for Allstate, of all places, back in the 90s. And I used to go with him to loss locations doing those carrier side back when they used to pay out. Uh, and then he got so burned out. After Where was that at? Where was that at? North Carolina. North Carolina, okay. Yeah, he got really burned out after the McKinsey report came out. And he was getting all sorts of pressure from management, so he became a public adjuster. And I spent the last 10 years helping him grow his business and then law school and, and sort of naturally grew into first party insurance litigation. The next step beyond Was what, that the first thing you chose to do or is it the first job actually, opportunity? Actually, or? yeah. The first, uh, the first job I had as a summer in law school was in the same office as this guy. Nice. So did he influence you to come on or did you already kind of know that way? Bob's got a whole gravity unto himself, yeah. And now, so, green, headlock. so <laughs> green and Klein, or who's Klein? That's me. Okay, you're Klein? Yes. And you're originally from? Uh, born and raised in Houston. Oh, uh, right, you guys are all one big partnership firm? or Yes. Okay, yes. so you're power, so a powerhouse team right here. And you grew up in? Uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, North Houston. Uh, and basically got into this because my family had started their own business in 1922. They're at funeral homes. And my dad had basically told me, uh, you're not going to just come to work for me. Don't think of this as a safety net. you got to make your own way. And so I thought, uh, you know, law school is the way to go. I was a political science major, which made up I mean, I was either going to go work at a Starbucks or teach at a school. And I didn't want to do either of those things. So I went to law school. I actually worked at the Harris County DA's office all through law school uh, and actually got to try some cases. I was one of the few law students allowed to try cases for the DA's office. And then uh, after that, joined on with Bob. Uh, that was five-ish years ago and been here ever since. Nice. And then are you guys all based in Houston or do you, do you guys travel between? Because you got an office in Colorado, yeah. right? We're opening an office in Colorado. Colorado we yes. an office in Houston. You got John York. runs the country, uh, <laughs> and, but it's primarily in Florida and New York. Okay. And then I'm hopping between Colorado and Florida and Texas. Nice. Well, I'm sure you guys are busy with all the... You know, there's been an increased propensity of storms the last five years, too. Yes. We do that storm report track every year, and it's like there's more hurricanes, more hailstorms, more tornadoes. Every year it's growing exponentially. I'd mm -hmm. say there's an increase in casualty events and there's an increase in improper claims handling at the same time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the guys watching this right now probably know what policyholder attorneys do. 
Do you call Paul Soto Train Club first party insurance? First party insurance. Okay, they probably know. Some of these guys watching this right now have no idea. But you guys primarily deal with people who are getting shitty claim service yes. or bad claims or, or bad faith. You the way it. I say yeah. it, no one ever comes to us when things go right. We're always talking to people mm -hmm. when their roof has been messed up and doesn't get fixed or the insurance company's done something wrong. So no one's ever talking to us when they've had a good day. If they've reached an impasse and they, they come to us and we try to get it from there. And, and, and the way it works and the thing we really like about it, we'll get a file uh, representing a policyholder and so we'll file a lawsuit and then a whole new set of eyes gets to look at it on the side for the insurance company. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the adjuster who's been a SOB to somebody else, uh, somebody else looked at his work within the company, mm -hmm. higher up. Another lawyer, a defense lawyer, looks at his work. More importantly, he has to give us all of his notes, mm -hmm. all the notes that they've been taking while they're uh, adjusting the claim. Even the chicken scratch in the truck? Yes, mm -hmm. everything. And then... The one that said there's damage, but then that later on... Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how often that happens. Right. Yep. Uh, then we get to put them in a the chair with a, a camera on them uh, under oath and start asking questions, all right? Which is just really thrilling uh, from our point of, point of view. So, so, so tell me what that's like. I'm trying to picture this. You're in a courtroom is there a jury? It's not a courtroom. I'm talking about the, the, the first deposition. First step, okay. You take the deposition. Right. You take the deposition of the adjuster who actually right. did the work. Then you take the deposition of the corporate representative who's way above him. Now the beauty of that is that corporate representative has never seen this file before mm -hmm. until you file a lawsuit. And so you're cross-examining mm -hmm. him. He's trying to defend what the adjuster did. And when there's bad stuff in there, he finds it difficult to uh, defend. And it makes him uncomfortable, and they, you know, they pay claims uh, so, because of that. Now, the the real beauty of taking that kind of deposition is the first half of the deposition, they admit what they're supposed to do. All right. the good things you're supposed and, to do to help your insured and help the policyholder, right. and we, of course, we look for coverage. Exactly, you're in mm -hmm. great hands with us. Yeah, if there if there's a gray area, we always go with the insured and, and not our way. We're right. looking for coverage to help the insured. We're not trying to save money. Mm -hmm. And then you take them through the file and show how they did just the opposite throughout the file. The beautiful thing, so last night we had the first Democratic debate, and like all presidential debates, all you want to say is that wasn't the question. We get By to way, do I that. It. Was it? Yeah, it was, they had all 23 of them up there? No, they got more of them tonight. But it's, it's you know, the, you get the political answer with the, you ask them a question and they instead answer the question that they want to answer. You get to call them on that in a deposition. You get to n drill down on them say, that's not what I asked you. Answer my question. And if it comes to it, the judge will say, answer the lawyer's question. Don't do this BS stuff. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. So tell me about, uh, tell me about a, like a large claim you had. Because I got to know for people watching this. Like a lot of guys want to know well, when is it when is it appropriate to bring an attorney on in, in the claim process? So maybe start with like what's the worst claim you ever handled? And let me start at the beginning of that. Uh, and we've made a vow every time we have anything like this to talk real briefly about statutes of limitations. Yeah. And the reason is because if you have a statute of limitation run, there's nothing we can do. Uh, and sometimes that will run while it's in the hands of a contractor. Uh, we had a case uh, just a couple of months ago. Oh, he's sitting on a bad file for too long and he runs yes. out of statute. Yes. Okay, I got you. S O L. We had yeah, exactly means more than more than statute of limitations. We had a case that comes in to the office and we had just signed it up because first thing we look for statute of limitations. Okay. And, and what's, what state was this? This was in Texas. And, what, and what's that? Is that four years? Uh, it, it's safest complicated. Safest two years for the date of the loss, but the real is two years from the date the cause of action accrues, but it can depend. Unless it, that's what, not what the language is. Right. And the policy. It, it, it it's gets very complicated. complicated. Uh, and so we filed the case. Right. We made the deadline. And by almost return... You missed a point. The limitation was running in two days when yeah. we got the file. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can say that part. It, it was did. running in two days. Oh, I mean, it was up in two days. In two days, in two days, you'd have been SOL. If we'd have filed it a day after we filed it, then we would have had no case. They would have got a... Now, was it the property that called you out of the blue, or was it a contractor brought it? It was a you? contractor. Contractor, brought okay. But within 30 days of that, the insurance company sent us a check for $800,000. And that wasn't even a release. That was just undisputed. So you amount. didn't you didn't demand that money or no? It was, it was the undisputed lawsuit. amount they owed to fix the roofs. Right. Like RCV depreciation. Our depreciation. I don't think they took depreciation. I think that was an RCV payment. Yeah. Okay. They just got the RCV check. And so if we'd follow that one day late, that money would have gone away mm -hmm. uh, because they would just they would just said you don't get it because they're statutory. Just dumb question. 
But why would they have never released that money to begin with? They wouldn't have had to. You'd have no recourse. You wouldn't be able to sue them for it. Well, mean, why, they, why, did, why, why, why didn't they release the ACV? I, in a, in a I don't know. You know okay. They're just improperly handling the claim. That's, That's a crazy. default position. Unless you force them to do it, a lot of times they're just not going to pay. Mm -hmm. and, and Anthony, on that subject, too, of statute of limitations, it, it is so different in every jurisdiction. And you can't just pick up a policy and figure it out, all mm -hmm. right? You've got to know right. the law in the jurisdiction. You've got to know what the policy language is. Mm -hmm. You have to know whether or not the policy language is void because of the law in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we encourage everybody to do, and, and we'll do this, uh, send us a copy of, if there's a statute problem or you're worried about it, send us a copy of the policy. We'll look at it. Uh, you don't have to hire you us charge to do, for, that. do you charge for that? No, Not a no, no. Free attorney stuff, I like that. No, you know, Free we're, consultations. We're, yeah. we're, we're all in this together, right. you know, and, and we don't like to see people who have valid claims not recover. Yeah. Uh, and we would, we like it a lot when people, you know, sell their cases before coming to us. Uh, and that works a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the insurance companies just won't do the right thing, that's when we step in. Tell me about a time, like the, one of the worst situations, a loss you came across. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe they did this. You felt like good about doing what you do on a policy of insurance. Because you like in Texas, there's a lot of newspaper yeah. articles bashing attorneys and contractors. Shame on you for looking for sticking up for the property owner, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But tell me about a time when you were like, man, I really feel good about what I'm doing because it really helps the there situation. There was one time in particular where I was representing, and, and this was probably the smallest case on my docket. It was a small residential case we were doing as a favor. And it was a girl, she late reported her claim. It was a year late. Texas? Or? It was in Texas. It was in San Antonio. The insurance company goes out and they deny her. And we file suit. I get the file. I start looking through the file. The adjuster's reporting, and she confirmed this. The adjuster says, okay, well, there is storm damage to your roof. I confirmed it's from the data loss. I confirmed that there was coverage for that loss period. I confirmed that every other house around you got a brand new roof. Unfortunately, per your policy, you have a one-year deadline to report the claim. You didn't do it. Claim denied. So she did file. She had filed a couple of days after, a couple of weeks after, whatnot. Yeah. Problem is, policy didn't say anything to the anything like that at all. I got the policy. I went through with a fine tooth comb. I called up the lawyer for the other side and said, D "Have you seen this?" And sure enough, the case resolved itself very favorably shortly thereafter. That was one. Of, that was the time. So just bam, they paid. Yes. After that, so you didn't have to go to court. No, we, we had to file a lawsuit. We, no, a lawsuit, it, we settled court. it with two phone calls, and that one for me because I mean she didn't have a lot of money. It was it, it was her roof. It was important to her, uh -huh. and they really really screwed her. And, and so do, was, do you think somebody like intentionally just said you know well, this, so I'm assuming an IE came out and paid for all this damage, some desk or some supervisor saw and goes no it was well, it was, gonna, it was a, it, a staff adjuster. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna throw the one year at him and see if they bite on it and yeah. go away. Exactly. I, I'll give you an example. Yeah. That, that's an intentional, yeah. it's an intentional yeah. act. Right? Anthony, I'll give you another documented intentional act. There was a uh, woman that we represented in Hurricane Ike. She had been a bookkeeper for a small motel in the medical center. Mm -hmm. uh, she cut a deal with her boss to buy the motel. And she did it on paper, you know, a promissory note. Hurricane Ike comes through, uh, ruins her business. She can't make the note. And she's about to be foreclosed on. She put all of her life savings into this motel. And they're not paying. We get a copy of just their, straight denial. They don't think yes, it's damaged, or, right? Okay. And we get a copy of their uh, notes, claim notes. The adjuster had actually written in the claim notes. Well, now that she's gotten the public adjuster, I I, I know that I owe her some money, but I'm not going to pay it. <laughs> Vindictive. And, and in the file, in the file. And so then we take his deposition. Mm -hmm. You can imagine how much fun that was. And in his deposition, he said, "You know." That was wrong. I'm going to go back and I'm going to recommend that we pay it. And of course, I had to rag him around a little bit more. You know, why? Why do we have to file a lawsuit? Why do we have to take your deposition right. uh, before you do the right thing? He said, "Well, uh, and you know, how do you know it's going to get paid?" He said, well, I'm going to recommend it. So, but I didn't get the check written. But finally, we got the check, uh, and it was because of that deposition. But you know what I would think it was really because of? He watched her in her deposition mm -hmm. and he saw what he had done to her uh -huh. and how emotional that was to her and so I think he found a heart someplace in there and, and you think and, some of these carriers and their agents get a little disconnected from the actual grief oh clearly and they're yes. going out and they're just bean counting 
Yeah, okay. I'll say that every single case that we take on has already been through. Generally, a contractor has tried to do the right thing. A PA might have gotten involved and tried to help them, mm -hmm. and it's finally come to our doorstep. These are people's homes. They put their life savings into it. It's the most valuable asset they've got. And the roof over your home can be a third to a half of the value of the property. That's what keeps you sheltered. Or mm -hmm. it's a small business owner, and the roof is caved in, and they can't operate, and they can't earn a living anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they're literally down because of that storm. And then they get kicked while they're down when they get their claim denied. And so it is very satisfying helping those people out. Mm -hmm. And the way we operate is on a contingency basis. So we're not charging them unless we make them better off in a pure betterment. And it feels great to do that. Yeah. Tell me about the difference between like operating in Texas and Colorado for an attorney. Uh, it's a very different legal environment, uh, and I'll uh, and I'll say this from our experience in Colorado and Texas. You know, it's a pretty fraternal, it's a pretty gregarious. We we all mutually respect most for the most part each other, except for some Dallas lawyers. Be careful. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, we there there's a shared mutual respect. Other jurisdictions uh, don't necessarily have that. It's a much harsher legal environment. Uh, there are some. Those are bad faith penalties in Texas, for example. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. I, I'll give you one quick example. There was one insurance company in Colorado did a investigation, a PI investigation of me. Yeah, he was in their claim file. And I'm asking the guy, why'd you do that? He says, because you're from out of state. Mm -hmm. And instead of paying somebody to, to look at the claim, which they finally did, and they finally paid it right. after the appraisal, they were spending money trying to dig up some dirt on me. So, Jeez. But yeah, a lot of jurisdictions have uh, some sense of uh, what is a standard proper claims handling. They have there's some uniformity uh, in that, but the difference comes into what are the penalties for violating that for breaching that insurance policy. Yeah. So what is that in Texas? For example? So in Texas, you've got a couple different remedies. The biggest, I think, the the best one for Texas, and it seems crazy, is that you get attorney's fees for breach of contract, and not all jurisdictions have that. So if you prove breach, the insurance company also has to pay your attorney's fees. So That's like on a lady that you helped, um, which one was that? You, that was, yeah. Did you get attorney fees in that situation? Yes. You did? Okay. Yeah. And that was paid by the carrier? So it was the settlement that they paid included bad faith and included attorney's fees. It was okay. They, they never spell it out because of reinsurance? purposes because if they pay a separate amount for attorney's fees. So you just agree to a sum. A we sum. Yeah. Number. And our goal is always to, to after everybody's been paid, to have enough to uh, uh, fix the roof. Or yeah, because I can imagine some residential situations, especially when you're talking about a roof, mm -hmm. a 30 square roof. If you didn't get attorney fees, it might become cumbersome it's, it's or difficult for Mrs. Smith to even get I mean, we, I, I tried a case a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, and we got a bad faith verdict. The actual damages, the amount of the loss is only like $22,000. The attorney's fees are $80,000. Wow. And so the judgment went from $20,000 to over $100,000 because of the other remedy. So Texas has what's called the Prompt Payment of Claims Act, mm -hmm. which basically says, and it's changed uh, since September of 2017, but basically it says if we prove they didn't pay a certain amount, they owe a penalty interest on top of the amount of the claim. It's based on a, t on a time clock that's starting? Right. It, it runs... When so the claim's they, filed? They've got, it, they've got certain deadlines they have to abide by. They have a certain number of days to acknowledge the claim, a certain number of days to investigate, a certain number of days to pay it. If they don't pay it after that time frame, then the per annum penalty attaches. So that's the other remedy that you get. And Texas also allows for bad faith. So you can get up to treble damages for egregious triple? conduct. Up to triple. Really? Uh, Cases rarely, if ever, no, you, have have, never. you have to have a knowing violation. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, very you, high you, standard to prove that. Right. You usually don't sell a case based upon that, but you will sell it based upon prompt pay. Now, in sounds like the one where you they slipped in the uh, was it you or you that slipped in the uh, the one year. Oh yeah, that, that was might, that might have been. Couldn't that be considered bad faith? Yeah, no, that, that, is, that but was bad faith. Oh, so you got triple on that? Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't go to trial on it. The, okay. the number they were willing to settle for was enough. So you settled before you? Okay, got it. Yeah, so the triple damage is, a, is really a hammer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. To okay, with facts like that, you want to go trial that case? You'll see what happens. We had a case uh, out of Ike uh, that I tried representing a uh, Hindu temple, mm -hmm. and they denied it completely. Uh, and in that case, did you get the goat? Did you get the goat? Oh, were you dealing with the goat rims up top? Or, no, or there's no damage? No, 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 not that. The new okay. one. Yeah. They bought a new temple out there. <laughs> the new yeah. one has. I one. know about the goat rims. <laughs> yeah. The hill damage on the wall. And this, the one, this was a Lloyd's of London, and they refused throughout the whole time to pay any money whatsoever. And one of the reasons why they were refusing to pay it was they said that the address was wrong on the policy. The address on the policy, if you went there, it was actually a topless bar. And so 
in, but it was the same address over and over again, their adjuster in a deposition said it would be wrong to deny the claim based upon that address and they continued to deny the claim. In that case, I think the, the damages were actually $300,000. We got a $2.5 million uh, uh, jury verdict because the jury went five times the actual amount plus uh, uh, attorney seats. Court knocked it down to three times. To but yes, the law, yeah, right? but sometimes you sometimes and is that just are those kind of things decided by a jury or a judge? Jury, jury, jury. Yeah. jury. So a jury actually can decide the award amount. Yes, jury. jury they, have certain, they have certain parameters like three times or four times. No, or, you're not even allowed to tell them that. Uh, you just argue for uh, punitive damages, and there's ways to to to, to hint at it. But okay. uh, like in this case, we didn't tell them a certain amount, but they went five times. Uh, Why do you suppose they did that? Because it was such an egregious... Because the, the, the adjuster from England got on the stand and in cross-examination, I mean, I asked her, you heard your own adjuster say it would be wrong to do what you're doing. Are you still going to sit here and do it? Tell the jury you're going to do it, still. And she said, well, I'm going to follow my lawyer's advice and do it. And so they, they were just mad. Right. Uh, so she still, she, so, she, so she still was not going to pay. Right. The money. It was just obvious that they, they were yeah. not doing the right thing. So, yeah. The, yeah so, right. so that's that's the bad faith in Texas. Then Colorado is a, is a horse of a different color. The law there is actually really great. If you show the insurance company unreasonably delay or deny payment, so delay unreasonable, delay. automatic treble damages. Not knowing, just unreasonable. Right. Just unreasonable. Now, this is something else to bring up: appraisal. Everyone always talks about appraisal. I see mm. all over the place. Invoke appraisal. Invoke appraisal. Invoke appraisal. Let's talk about that mm -hmm. because that can affect your remedies you can recover. For, in Texas, for example, mm -hmm. if you go through the appraisal process, not even if you invoke it, if the insurance company invokes it or you invoke it, whoever, mm -hmm. it knocks out any potential to recover bad faith, prompt pay, or attorney's So all litigation's done. It's baptism by even appraisal, if, it's gone. Yeah. Even if they wait to the last minute, even if they wait till after they've been sued. That hopefully, the Supreme Court may just heard arguments to change that. We don't know what they're going to yet, do. Yet, if you file suit against a carrier in Texas, a carrier can invoke appraisal yep. and yeah. usurp your litigation. And it zeroes right? out your, your extra contractual damages. Only that's, one ex that's kind of messed up, isn't it? It is. <laughs> There's only one exception to that, and that's in the event that the insured has already attempted to invoke appraisal and the carrier said, no, we won't go to appraisal, in which case the insured is essentially forced to file a lawsuit, uh -huh. uh, in which case the carrier has waived their right to invoke right. appraisal at that point because they've already said How no. How many times do you that. see this invoking of appraisal after a litigation is filed? Not, not as often as we would think. Uh, I've, I'd say it happens in probably 15 to 20 percent enough to of be annoying cases. Uh, enough to be irritating uh, yeah. but it's not it's not nearly as prevalent as I thought well the problem is it happens in the bad faith cases so right. they, so when it's a when it's a real clear hey we messed up yes then, Shit, let's go back to appraisal let's yeah, pay it exactly. they, they, they don't pay the bad faith exactly right. right. appraisal as a shield gotcha. whereas in some cases uh, a, a smaller claim sometimes they can use appraisal as a sword the insured can invoke appraisal as a sword and force them to pay but in the larger losses when there's bad faith that play, oftentimes the carriers will invoke appraisal as a shield. Now compare that to Colorado, however, where if you go through the appraisal process, and there's a recent Supreme Court opinion from Colorado that sort of alters that, that theory, but uh -huh. in, in practice, or in principle, if you invoke appraisal and they pay it, the payment of the appraisal award can be evidence of their unreasonable delay or delay. Delay, yeah. So it's almost the exact opposite. Because delay is delay is yeah. like an art form of the insurance carrier. Right. They got a t it's an art form. I mean, I've been through it myself. I they mean, are the second adjustment, and 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 then they send it down to the engineer and the documentation engineer report and the. That it, I mean, they got it down to well, the science. report too, too long. You know, oh, yeah. It wasn't our fault. It was a, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not our fault. Donut Engineering or EFI yeah. or Hague or anything. And I'm assuming there's flyers. certain things a carrier is doing along the way when they know they're delaying. Sending out the engineer here, sending out so-and-so here, that they're actually trying to hit those steps mm -hmm. so they don't get hit with the delay tactic. Yep. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Well, so we sent out an engineer, a third-party engineer, and we sent them at 60 days. I mean, I don't know the time the time punch, but they're playing that game too, mm -hmm. right? No, they That's are. That's right. And contractors and PAs need to be vigilant and never sleep on a file, even if it's just, hey, I'm following up because you said you're going to have your report to me on this date. That day's come and gone. I still haven't heard from you. You said you're going to call me back, and you never heard back. And just those self-serving documentation of the file, to at least to document the fact that the Which helps us when we take the deposition just, I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. Let me ask you, is there any time that just stands out in your head? Uh, let's just pick Texas, because a lot of guys watch this probably from Texas and Colorado. Name what, like a, a time in Texas. Is there, a, is there a time period in Texas if you're a contractor? Like, let's say a, a homeowner filed a claim. An adjuster didn't show up for 30 days at all. 
Is that is that possibly that would a, arguably be a violation of the prompt pay statute in and of itself? Okay, and then how about the dish, how about the distribution of the first ACV check? Is there a time clock there? Sixty like, days. It's sixty days. So the time they inspect that property. So it, it, let, let, me, let me correct it. It's actually sixty-five days because they have from first notice of the loss, they have five days. The insurance company does to acknowledge receipt of the claim, and then there's other deadlines that fall in between that. Uh -huh. But the penalty begins to run on the sixtieth day after the notice is or after that five-day period. Gotcha. So sixty, the sixty-fifth day would be, I think, this the safest time where if they've not given the RCV check, if they're delaying for other reasons, day sixty-five. Right. Is, but, but, but if they ask for any kind of documentation. Uh, the, the contractor and the public adjuster and others, of course, mm -hmm. to get them that documentation as soon as possible. Yeah, because, that, the because then, yeah, if, if they ask for something yeah. that you don't get, then it doesn't start running until you and, give them that. And that is time. that typically the same in Colorado, kind of the similar uh, the it, 60 days? It, it, it's different. not as structured. It's, it's just reasonable. Yeah. Well, it's reasonable. It's whatever the jury thinks is reasonable okay. or doesn't think is reasonable. Yeah. But there's no I think most carriers get the stuff out with under 60 days, but there are situations. I remember in Florida, for example, me handling stuff, you know, just six, seven years ago, where the homeowner didn't get anything, no paperwork, nothing for, for over 60 days in some situations. I remember, I've seen it myself. Well, the other thing I would say is look at the policy. Texas has this. I've seen it a few places in Florida and a few places in Colorado. The policy itself will have built-in deadlines that we must acknowledge within a certain number of days. We must uh, let you know if, what, if we're going to cover this within a certain yeah. number of days. So the policy itself may have requirements. And so in Texas, it just maps a from pay state. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. So with all this stuff going on, guys, I mean, why is it so damn hard for a carrier... Just to simply pay that, of course, you guys would be out of business if they just paid the claim, right? If that was the reason we were out of business, so I'd the, be okay. Half the contractors yeah, out there, I mean, they'd, be, they'd, mm -hmm. they'd be doing bids. You know, the whole AOB, contingency agreement, service agreement. The wind storm conference wouldn't be needed, mm -hmm. you know? They kind of, you know, you think about these carriers are perpetuating an industry by their own practices. Well, think yeah, about like... But, but, but Anthony, they make so much money on those clients, I mean, those customers who don't go to a lawyer. You're right. On the so, just, so many people just let's, give up. Let's talk about that. I've heard the numbers like what? one percent that actually go to litigation. Correct? I'm not sure about that. But Would be less? It's yeah. single digit percentages of claimants actually have a representative, a representative, yeah. whether that's a PA or an attorney. It's a vast minority yeah, it's like of one, people like who two, actually who actually second guess what their carrier is telling them right. they're owed. And you'd be surprised how many people with just valid claims, and I'm talking about you know the seven figure claims. Who they just don't want to file a lawsuit. No, they're, they're, they're loss, lawsuit adverse. They don't want to do it. They, well, it's daylight hours. It's money. It's well, time. Well, and it's, and it's fear, what, uncertainty. What their country club friends are going to think. Uh, yeah. Or those with the big buildings. Uh, we had that argument one time with, with the guy who really didn't want to do it. Uh, and in that particular case, it was it was a roof with 28 skylights. 34 skylights, 27 of them. Had do, you, do you suppose there's a bean counter at a lot of these big? Because most most of these carriers are now publicly traded companies. You guys know. And you try to you're nice to work at Eclub as a publicly traded company, and you start to lose accountability because you got different executives doing different things, and you got the then you got the people under them and the people under them, and a couple assholes over here, and there's a couple guys up here playing golf mm -hmm. all the time that don't even know what these guys are doing. It's just, there can be a disconnect of accountability at any large company. But do you think there's a you know there there must be a bean counter there because you hit it in the nail on the head earlier. You know, if, if you got ten client, if you got ten clients, and you do them all wrong, but only one of them sues, there's a bean counter count in the nine that they saved, they mm -hmm. save money on, and the lawsuit cost them X. And hell, let's keep let's keep running how we are because the lawsuit just ain't it, ain't it ain't enough pain for us to, to change our ways. Is that exactly. is that what's going on? I, you know, exactly I, what's going I think on. that's precisely why the lawmakers in these states have the treble damages and punitive damages type awards and remedies is because they need a deterrent. Because they know that the that the consumer is systematically under enforcing their rights, and if they don't have that juice, that extra above the liability under the policy, then that one out of ten that does right. file I mean, lawsuit that's, isn't going to make a dent. That's a good point, John. Because I don't know of any other industry that has that. Where for a breach of contract, you're going to get prompt pay damages for not for not, right? Uh, or even bad faith. I mean, you that know, didn't go. Yeah. That didn't go cross institutions. I think it's special because of the systematic underpayment of claims and that's just known. Um, I think it's also important because everyone has to have insurance. Mm -hmm. And the lawmakers themselves have to have insurance just, on their car, on their home. Mortgage coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, everybody's, everybody's got yeah, you're right. It's just required by the bank. Yep. It's required for your car. It it's is. an economic safety net. And sure guys to, love that. And that's is. like the mafia. Yeah. <laughs> the new mafia. I hope something bad doesn't happen. <laughs>
So what do you guys see? Do you guys see some? Do, what, what do you see changing? Is it getting worse with the carriers? Is, it, is the, it changing? How, they're they're, they're systematically like, taking away rights and remedies under the law, and they do it under this guy. And, and it goes. It doesn't quite cross party lines, but it goes to this idea of we need to deregulate, right? We need to let businesses be businesses and deregulate and stop all these trial lawyers from running to the courthouse. And what happens is not it is grand step. It's slowly, incrementally. That's, prop that's propaganda. They're using oh, yeah, that yeah, propaganda. They, they absolutely that's right. are. The few of you guys are out. See, I don't think there's enough of you guys. I think there should be an army. I know you guys don't want to hear that, but there should be an army of policy attorneys. We don't mind taking on yeah. taking on smaller cases to teach these carriers a lesson. Because until they feel the pain, a publicly traded company, they care about their stock price. Dude. They don't mm. care about somebody complaining down here about shit. No, this affects stock. As soon as it affects that stock price, they're gonna pay attention. That's gonna take an army of people that do what you guys do. You know what I mean? For that to happen on smaller cases too, and until that happens, they ain't gonna change their ways. No, you know what I mean? Well, but you're we, talking about trends. We've, we've seen a little bit of hope it's a trend uh, lately. I started as a, a, a personal injury lawyer. Uh -huh. And my entire career, I never set, settled a single case without filing a lawsuit. Uh, because I didn't think I could really get into it until I met my wife and she was a client. I had to settle that one hurry because I wanted to marry her. And, <laughs> and, uh, but what we've seen lately uh, just, just really this yeah, this year. This, this year, we they've got a notice requirement in Houston. I mean, in, in Texas, where you have to give them 60 days and tell them what you think the case is worth. We did that. We put attorney's fees uh, before they filed an answer. I, I got a, it's a firm we've worked with a lot. Right. Uh, I got a telephone call that said they're going to pay your demand. So you think they're they're loosening up or they're? I think, to come? And, and, and we've had we had another. We talked about maybe cosmetic. Uh, exclusions. We had another carrier say uh, that they denied the claim. We said, "Look, the the, the company is reevaluating mm -hmm. its position on, on uh, cosmetic exclusions." Mm -hmm. uh, we had another case where it had a, a real a terrible arbitration clause in it, where you had to go to New York to arbitrate the case. Mm -hmm. uh, we had. A Do you think there's a changing of the guard up there where people are starting to go, "Hey"? Maybe we should rethink this. I don't know. I think my I mean, social is, media is really putting a lot of stuff in the light these days. It wasn't there five it years ago. It could be it. I think that my theory is that they have tried enough cases that the defense bar knows who they are and they know that true. they mean business. And that so when they see certain firms, try, yes, like your name, they're like, oh my god, these guys are for real. Well, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, there's, there's, they're going to come with their shit together. There's firms, yeah, any, 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 there, there's yeah, <laughs> any type of legal arena. There's people that'll do it. You know, they'll do it for the chief. They'll settle cases with for personal injury, any any kind of thing. And there's other ones that I mean, we, we've argued cases on appeal. I've been in front of this circuit. Bob's been in front of Bob's been in front of the Texas Supreme Court. I mean, there's you know, we'll we'll take it all the way, and then we'll take it further. And, and I think that's important. And a lot of policyholder lawyers will do that. That's one of the unique things about our industry is that because this is all we do with all the policyholder lawyers they're all uniquely equipped to do that which is a very mm -hmm. good thing uh, and so I think that hopefully that's that's also part well, of it. but there there's some law firms that churn and burn and they'll just sign up a bunch of cases settle them cheap and go on the next one what sometimes without even litigating uh, we certainly don't don't no. believe that should be done mm -hmm. now you had said a question earlier about sort of the the erosion of policyholder rights that's happening and I think that that is absolutely happening. It's under the broad umbrella of tort reform, uh, and a lot of states in Florida just passed the AOB reform. Uh, Hunter's going to be talking about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas just uh, passed some some new rules on deductibles and and AOBs, uh, and they're just making it a little bit harder incrementally, one legislative yep. session at UPPA. a time. UPPA. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Let's keep the contractor silent so he can't yes. educate Mrs. Smith. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly. horrible. And now the only way to combat that is for the contractors, the PAs, the first party attorneys, right. and the vendors like you guys that are servicing all of us to understand we've got a common interest power, here. Power numbers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, guys, well, most of the, uh, you know, the, at the Wind and Storm Conference you guys come to, uh, we bring the policyholder attorneys, the public adjusters, the contractors all together. We started doing that four years ago, and that's morphed now into a, oh, it's invaluable. a bonanza. I mean, yes, three, I four thousand people invaluable. show up. And now the APA is formed, which is starting to look at a criminal nature, which is intentional fraud, mm -hmm. yeah. which I think if I saw somebody like the APA and Doug Quinn, he's not one of us. He's actually a victim, yeah. right? He's going out and meeting all the attorney generals around the country yes. right now, mm -hmm. every day in one of them, and, pe and preaching, the, preaching the song. Yeah. And so I think that that word's getting out. Mm -hmm. I don't think these guys are that dislocated that they don't see that going on. Right. Because it's all over social media, right? Yes. 
And there's got to there to me, hell, nobody nobody wants to go to jail. So right. and nobody wants to go to be on the front page of the newspaper. I would think to try to save $10 on a, on a claim mm -hmm. um, and commit some kind of intentional fraud. So I think people on the executive level, mm -hmm. I'm just guessing, might be starting to wake up to the fact that they might want to look a little closer at what's going on in the streets because some some shenanigans out there, you know, ain't right. APA is doing a lot you of guys, good. Do you guys think any, some of that might be going on? No, I, I think they're starting yeah. to stand. I mean, there's a natural pendulum swing, too, but... Uh, uh, I think that has a lot. Yeah. Bob and I are, to full disclosure, we're on the advisory board of APA. We're founding members of the Texas chapter of APA, and I think that they're doing a lot of good things. The single most important one, perhaps, uh, and, and Doug could be a better spokesperson, but it's, it's what you just said. It's having those meetings with yeah. top law enforcement of any jurisdiction. and Attorney saying, generals, insurance commissioners. Yeah, and just the premise that, look, it's not just the insureds that are committing fraud here. Your carriers and the engineers that they're retaining, they could be committing fraud too. And that fra insurance fraud cuts both ways. Yeah. And that, that itself is very interesting. Fraud can be a systematic where there's not one person accountable for it. It's right. kind of like the Nazis, you know? They set up this system it's to do what someone... they did in World War II, and nobody was really accountable. Right. It was hard to, like, there wasn't one person because they set up a system. Right. It's like that when we were looking earlier at the RFG versus DMO. Right. In the trade labor rate. Well, it says, in the back end, it says DMO, but on the insurance paperwork, it says RFG. There's a huge price difference there. Now, that's not necessarily criminal fraud, but... When you're making this aware, hundreds and hundreds of contracts are making this aware. It starts to back snowball. to the carrier, mm -hmm. and they're coming up with excuses even after they see that it's not right. Now it becomes a systematic. Well, this is the way we've always done things, mm -hmm. and that's a systematic abuse. Or an it's engine, underpaying a claim. Or, and, and like expert list, I mean, they'll use the same Hague engineering or over and over and over again, yeah. over and over when they know they could write the report for them. I could write the report for them. Mm -hmm. You know what it's going to say, and but you send it to them anyway, so you've got this. So, argument in your file that you're, you're not in bad faith. I heard a rumor that you guys were going to take on a class action for RFG versus DMO nationwide. Is that true? We're looking at it. <laughs> that'd be, a, that'd be a hundreds, hundreds I mean, of millions of dollars in the last yeah. 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are like, yeah, they got, you got to get your paperwork ready. All your last 10 years of claims, mm -hmm. reset that trade labor rate from uh, DMO to RFG, send it into these guys. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars on the settlement. It'd be huge. Somebody should take that up, man. I think you're right. That's how you teach. That's how you teach. Make a well. That's how you teach people a lesson. Yeah, that'd be a hell of a landfall. That's true. It's not my. I'm not an attorney, so I wouldn't know. It probably would take about five years. It would take. <laughs> well, that's just to get through the appellate process. Yeah. Or by the time you got there, you'd be poor. You're like, man, hey, I ran out of money. If before. you don't know what Anthony's talking about, look up DMO RFG. Search within the SVG Facebook page, and you'll see a lot of people have been posting on this and raising awareness. Yeah. So you've got to go in and change those settings if you want to get paid properly. It's interesting. Now, there's a hundred things like that going on every day. You know what I mean? Oh, That's yeah. one of them. That's a big one. Well, guys, uh, thanks for coming on a speakeasy. We're actually going in the green room now to shoot for the first time ever several courses inside SVGU so that contractors, future contractors, hell, maybe a hundred years from now, could sit and watch a course uh, when, when it is appropriate to bring on a policyholder attorney. What is a first party, first party insurance attorney? Uh, what do you guys do in this claim process? Because a lot of contractors are stuck in this quagmire. They're stuck, man. They don't have an engineering degree, a law degree, a public adjuster license, and they're getting that finger pointed on them left and right. But you almost need all those people in your back pocket, like your That's Rolodex, right. to operate in a $100 billion plus industry, man. You, and, you need and, and when they give up, they put that in a file. That file is full of good lawsuits we would love to look at. Mm. Nice. Only as strong as your team. Yeah. All right, guys, we got to head in the green room, shoot some more, and then we're going to steak dinner tonight. Sounds good. All right. See you soon. Booyah, baby.